Again, this is Joe from the Be Kind Podcast with John and Tom again. <laughs> Just I, I didn't forget Tom's name. I forgot John's name. I know I'm right here. <laughs> well, because there's Joe, Doctor Joe. There's me, Joe. There's John. There's Tom. It's it's very confusing. And the cat meow too. So maybe we should do a restart that, there. <laughs> oh, that was my favorite part. Right? <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should leave it. <laughs> well. We're recording this episode immediately after our last episode, so we apologize if the world has ended in the next past week and we have n- are not going to comment on it at all, but rest assured, we are <laughs> right there with you, hopefully, if nothing crazy happened. So we're here to talk about another study from Faunalytics, a vegan research think tank that does amazing work related to activism and animals and compassion in general, and Tom is one of the researchers over there who does a lot of these amazing studies, and this next study is about people's perceptions of fishes and chickens. So, Tom, I don't want to steal your thunder. Can you tell us a little bit about the study? Yeah, for sure. So, we're just diving into this line of research. Certainly, small-bodied animals like chicken and fish sometimes uh, take a back seat to, you know, people think about the suffering of, of of cows and pigs maybe before chicken and fish but they're killed in in just comparatively massive numbers so it's something that people are becoming more and more aware of and picking up on on a theme from you know last week's podcast uh the idea of how much effect can we have per dollar um looking at it that way chicken and fish seem like like a, a fairly good bet if you if you're predisposed to sort of that that perspective on things so Definitely an area where a lot of research is needed. And so we started off basically at square one and said, okay, we want to give advocates good information that they can use in their messaging when they're out dealing with people in, in whatever form of advocacy they're using. How do we do that? And we, we thought probably the first thing that we should do is sort of try to figure out what do people currently think about chicken chickens and fish um, what attitudes do they already have and which of those sort of beliefs are related to them maybe being willing to do uh, positive things for those animals so we actually started out just asking some advocates what beliefs do you think the the general public hold about chickens and fish and we also did a, a quick scoping survey where we asked just members of the general public what are some beliefs that you have because we really aren't weren't too sure like how many people for instance realize that that the animals feel pain right sort of a it has been a point of debate where are people at on that do they do they realize and and agree that that fish feel pain or that chickens feel pain so we wanted to to find out what beliefs people already had and so we got a, a short list from from what they gave us and after that, uh, ran the 35 or 36 items by a fairly large sample of, of Americans for both chicken and fish, just to see see where people were at, how strongly they would endorse each belief. And then we also asked them at the end of the survey uh, whether or not they'd be willing to sign a petition to increase the welfare of whichever animal they answered questions about, and also whether they'd be willing to sign a diet pledge to reduce their own consumption of that animal. And that step allowed us to see which of those beliefs were most strongly associated with being willing to make those animal positive changes. And so in terms of results, perhaps it's not surprisingly more people were willing to sign the petition than were willing to take the diet pledge. There's an advocacy message in that as well, where if you want to use the foot in the door technique, which is where you get somebody to say yes to to one thing and then they're more likely to to say yes to something else that you ask them for we'd say probably start with asking for a petition signature it's it's an easy ask right you put your your name down and your address and you sign and that's the sort of end of it versus you know are you willing to take a diet pledge which sort of requires more more effort right and more effort over time from them so we found that 37% of participants agreed to sign the fish welfare petition and 40% agreed to sign the chicken welfare petition. 
and then 30% of participants took the pledge to reduce their consumption of fish and 31% to reduce their consumption of chicken. Some of the pro-animal beliefs um, were already pretty common among people. So most people understand that air and water quality are important to chickens and fish. So we think based on that, that maybe education around those topics isn't necessarily needed, but the beliefs can be evoked or sorry, invoked as necessary. So if you have people and some, the person in front of you is agreeing that, you know, that chickens need fresh air and fresh water and, and enough room to exercise, um, and then you show them the reality of, of industrial farming, it, it, that's not the reality of how chickens, chickens live, right? So we thought it was a, an opportunity because certainly people more strongly endorse those beliefs that, that you know, chicken do need those things to be healthy and to, to, to be healthy and happy. Uh, but fewer seem to understand the, the reality of how most chickens are, are farmed. So we think that's a, that's a spot, an area of opportunity, right, to, to sort of help them make that, that leap between the two. The beliefs that had the largest correlations with somebody signing the, the pledge to reduce their fish consumption or that fish are more intelligent than people give them credit for, that many farms have horrible living conditions and that fish are loving. So people who held those beliefs, even if those beliefs weren't particularly popular in the population, the people who most strongly endorsed those beliefs were also more likely to do positive things in, in taking the pledge to reduce their own consumption. In terms of the fish welfare signatures, the beliefs that fish are more intelligent than people give them credit for, that they're beautiful. And again, the idea that fish farms have horrible living conditions were, were among the top. Um, for chickens, uh, for signing the pledge, were that chickens are beautiful, that they need room to explore and exercise, and that they're loving. And the largest correlations with the petition signatures for chicken were that, again, need room to explore and exercise, the, the horrible conditions, um, and the intelligence. So based on that, it gives advocates a sense of, okay, where are the beliefs that, that we could maybe be touching on? What are the things that if I can get somebody to, to take a step in this direction of, of believing this about a chicken, that they're more likely to, to then take positive steps about a chicken. And it's an early study. We weren't on the ground. We weren't talking to people. We weren't presenting them leaflets with arguments based around these things. So that's something that still needs to be tested in future research. But this was the initial like sort of wide wide lensed approach to to getting our our footing on the question and trying to identify which of those beliefs we want to then test out in messaging sort of try to pit them against each other and see which one may have may have the most uh, most effect on the ground basically I love this study because it actually relates to some of the conversations we've been having here on this podcast we've had a couple episodes specifically focused to fishes and birds and a few other episodes about fishes and alternative food products and things like that. And for me, I guess something that stands out when I look at a lot of your studies is you look a lot at the number of lives saved, lives as in just the life as the animal is one single entity. And a lot of times when we're activists, we talk to people and you say, oh, have you ever considered going vegan? No, but I really only eat seafood every once in a while. I'm a pescatarian. And mm. our gut reactions go, that's great. Let's keep it up. Just try and eat less and less. Though, if you think about it in terms of lives saved, really, we're better off trying to have people eat only red meat and not these fishes or chickens. Yeah, yeah. In, it, like you say, if you look at if you look at the number of animals, certainly because you know I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but you know pounds of flesh from a chicken compared to from a cow, right? Or um, even with with fish, it gets complicated because. Farmed fish are fed fish meal that comes from other fish that we've caught in the ocean. So for each farm fish, you're not just eating that one fish. It's, it's multiple fish that that fish has been fed. And even pork is fed fish that we've caught. And so it, it gets, the numbers get astronomically large very, very quickly, like trillions of, of fish caught per year kind of thing, right? And I, I think some of it is that idea of how like us are these animals, right? So chicken and fish uh, fish are cold-blooded they don't have eyelids because they live in water so they don't need to blink because their eyes don't need moistening and so we tend to think of them as not being as as emotional as as humans on that basis because they don't have facial expressions in the way we do whereas we look at a cow and say oh that's more like us but then a chicken lays eggs and it has a beak and 
And so there's that idea of how similar to us is this animal? And as a result, how do we, how do we think we're justified in treating it? And so definitely raising awareness about, about the internal lives of these animals and you know, helping people understand that they do have personalities um, to sort of echo back to the, the farm sanctuary conversation from last week, that they are loving, that they're beautiful. These, these types of, of things can potentially help people to help, help those light bulbs go on, right? And help people understand that these are sentient beings that, that have their own experience and existence. And I think it's also reassuring to look at the results of the study and know that and also the previous study I didn't mention in the last episode is that the biggest impact I saw from the studies or your data of people who visit farmed animal sanctuaries was a lot of them gave up seafood, which I thought was strange. But then we had a conversation with someone last week and she was mentioning how people who are looking for ways to reduce the suffering in their diet seafood's often the low-hanging fruit because most people don't have it all that often and it's expensive so if and it's not something that's culturally there in your face all the time for the most part so if you're looking for just an easy way to cut some type of animal product out of your diet seafood seems to be the way to go yeah for sure um and we have another study that um just came out that joe published on how much basically how much suffering is associated with with different types of food products so you can see where the, the most impactful food products that you could cut out would be. I, I think part of the credit for for the fish and seafood reduction after the sanctuary tour is is uh, due to Farm Sanctuary for sure. They they do a great job because one of the things people are worried about is that substitution effect, right? Where you say, okay, I won't eat this, but I'm going to eat more of that. Um, and sometimes the more of that actually leads to more lives lost, as as you pointed out with the comparison between cow and fish, right? Cows and fish. Um, so. Uh, Farm Sanctuary does a really good job of explaining across the industry, not just the animals that are there on the farm, but across the industry, what what the what the facts are, so that people I think are are less prone to making that that substitution. One more thing I thought about your studies we're describing is I think when you look at the results and impact and what we want to focus on our activism, you really have to be considerate of what angle you're approaching in terms of the welfare advocate versus the animal liberation advocate because someone could sign the petition and say well i think that fish and chickens deserve clean spaces to live quality living conditions and shouldn't suffer but yeah. it's okay as long as it's free range or wild caught salmon or something like that whereas if people think they shouldn't be exploited at all that's i think when you get more to the dietary choices am i on base with that idea I definitely think that there's uh, there are different philosophical approaches, right? We take at Phonolytics is generally an incrementalist approach. So we say, whatever positive steps you're willing and able to take at this point, we want to help support that. Here's some research that'll help you take that next step kind of thing. And I'm trying to think about, I guess the, the petition could be for the abolition of farming overall. The petitions that we used weren't on those lines, I was just thinking in terms of the, the question about abolition versus that that incremental increasing of welfare. But yeah, I would just, you know, this is, it's more of a, a moral and philosophical question in the absence of research showing which of those two approaches is actually more effective in, in bringing new people in. But yeah, so yeah, I don't have, have anything sort of research driven to, to help answer the question off the top of my head, unfortunately. Well, John, I've been talking a lot. Do you have any no, ideas about I'm, it? I'm just enjoying the show. <laughs> um, pretty soon people are going to get mad. I keep having those phonolytics crowd on the show and I just geek out with them. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, again, I love that you're talking about like animals that people don't really think about, like with fish and stuff. I love that you're talking about that, and I love that the last couple episodes that we've had, we've dealt with fish. Like we've had, you know, the book review, and uh, we had uh, Dominique Barnes on, who you know has a vegan seafood uh, company that she was a part of, and it's great that there's more focus on that coming up in the future and we're already like starting to make those steps. And I think that's great that we're talking about this. So something that I sent over one of my questions is uh, people have, there's very little opposition to going out there and petitioning to save the whales or bald eagles or things like that. These extraordinary wild animals that people see as special, unique, 
oftentimes intelligent and really worth saving. But where it gets tricky is when you look at the more quote-unquote common regular animals like chickens or tank-bred salmon or things like that. Do you think that us focusing advocacy on these extraordinary animals is doing a disservice to these more domesticated animals that don't get the same amount of attention? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. I would say if we're thinking across the movement as a whole and thinking about, you know, effect for each dollar spent, you know, do we do we put money towards bald eagles or whales or do we put money towards these farmed animals that we're, we're dealing with in the in the billions? I, I think that there's there's very likely a Um, a sort of crossover empathy effect and this is just me sort of spitballing not again research that I know of but the idea that as we saw in the in the the results that people who do agree that that chicken and fish are beautiful for instance um, were more likely likely to sign the petition so there might be the um, ability to show people particularly beautiful instances of chicken and fish that may or may not be farmed and Say or can sorry uh, that wouldn't be farmed so like wild animals or very well kept animals or what have you and contrast that with the conditions on those farms right so there'd be I think there's likely an opportunity to use those beautiful exceptional animals in the service of perhaps the less exceptional animals or the less commonly viewed as exceptional animals even in terms of making some comparisons about intelligence or empathy or those types of things, right? Where we tend to, like you say, ascribe intelligence to, to certain animals and not to others. It should be almost interesting to, to quiz people and say, oh, you know, which animal is, has passed the, the mirror test? And uh, so the mirror test is um, basically it's a way to determine if an animal understands that it's looking at itself, which means that it needs a sense of self. And so what they'll do is is sort of habituate the animal to the mirror and then put a mark on the animal where it will see it in the mirror and then watch the animal's reaction. So actually a fish, I think it's the clear water wrasse, if I'm saying that correctly, but has just passed the mirror test, right? Mm. And so I think most people would be, be surprised to know it's a fairly considered, and this isn't my area of, of, of research, but I believe it's considered a fairly um, fairly high bar to pass uh, where most people I don't think would think that, that a fish could do that. And so just helping them understand what these animals are, what their, what their experiences are, how smart they are. You know, there's some evidence that, that fish behave as though they're reacting emotionally to a breakup. Right? So if they lose their partner, their, their behaviors change in the kinds of ways that you think of and expect for somebody who's not feeling too happy about their life right Mm -hmm. and chickens show like emotional contagion right so this idea that that how you're feeling can affect me and and change how I'm feeling and so as we're learning that people do understand that yeah most chicken and fish can feel emotions just to help them understand just how complex these these animals are right and how how complex their their emotions and their lives are there's also evidence that chickens will respond with some empathy if they see another a chicken or some of their brood experiencing something that they consider aversive, that they kind of feel some of that themselves. They respond emotionally to that with heart rate and some other things like that. So I, I think that helping people understand those kinds of facts about these animals um, is definitely probably going to be quite important. Um, and I think that using those those exceptional sort of exemplar animals to help make that point may also be a useful useful tactic. Not something that I've tested yet, not something that I'm aware that's been tested, but it would be a hunch that you could help bring people into that sort of greater appreciation for the species through those kinds of tactics. Next week, I'm going to go to Fawn Luke's website and see a new study called The Effect of... Uh, <laughs> Emphasis on endangered species when I have a came for farmed animals or something. And I yep. will expect a footnote <laughs> giving credit to me in that study. <laughs> I'll credit. I'll credit. <laughs> <laughs> to tie us a little bit back to the farmed sanctuary study, I think a lot of it has to do with these documentaries, these books, these activists, what have you, who focus on these extraordinary animals, focus 
on these extraordinary animals. They show you, the viewer, the listener, whatever, all the qualities of these animals that make them essentially worth saving. And I think if the effectiveness of a farmed animal sanctuary is it takes that same concept but applies it to these everyday animals that we take for granted. So I think if people see it, like the study showed, they'll start to turn around. But unless you actively go out or you have an activist come out and help you, it's going to be something that just never happens for the most part. Yeah, for sure. And that's why we think that messaging and, and raising awareness about those particular aspects that, that the study showed were most strongly associated with being willing to make those positive changes is probably going to be a, a pretty good pretty good step. Who knows? We may test them out and find that some of them don't work very well at all. It's just one of those things that you acquire later on and it's more of a consequence of some other things that you already believed um, so it may not be the thing that started driving the effect but yeah definitely I think the more people learn and understand and I, I think there's a reason that that these animals have been depicted as as dull and unfeeling and uncaring right it, it makes that moral quandary less of a moral quandary you don't have to worry so much if it's you know, not really all that present anyway versus this animal with the rich internal life and emotions when it sees, you know, how other animals around it is, are being treated and how it feels when it's being treated. So I, I think those are all important parts of, of the, the story and the, the message that will help bring people on board, basically. Before we wrap <laughs> up this episode, can you share a story or some thing that's really stood on your mind about this particular study or this form of activism in general? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that, that I was maybe most surprised by was just the, the fact that most people are aware that these animals do suffer and, and can feel stress and those kinds of things because we weren't really sure. And, and you know, you think, well, if, if you understand that, then you should be all of the way there, basically. But what we kind of learned was, well, maybe maybe some other pieces of the, the puzzle are missing where, you know, research has shown that people dramatically overestimate the odds that the, the animals that they bought, flesh that they bought at grocery stores came from, you know, an animal that lived on rolling farm fields and a totally happy life. And they, they don't really understand the scale and nature of, of industrial farming, right? Um, and so I think that's, so we've got people at the point where they go, okay, animals suffer. Um, I understand that for the most part, not everybody endorses that, those items, but for the most part, they understand that. And now it's like, okay, so you understand that that would not be fun for an animal. Now here's their reality, right? And I think that, that people are probably um, more, going to be more open to that than they would that, that sort of next step than they would be if they didn't already have that existing sense that these animals do suffer. So I was glad to see that people were a bit further along than maybe, maybe I think people would have guessed they may have been. So that was a, a positive from the study in my eyes. I just know from my activism that a lot of times you feel like you have to lead with explain to people that fish have feelings, though according to this study, we should really be focusing more on the conditions of fish factories themselves, which... I didn't know how terrible they were until I started actively doing research about it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, going back to something we mentioned in the Farm Sanctuary podcast from last week, that different people are going to be at different stages when you're, when you're interacting with them. So some people may need that, that first step information from you, and some people may be ready to learn about factory farming, and some people may need recipes kind of thing because they're already trying but struggling a bit with X or Y, replacing X or Y in their diet. So it's it's human beings are really complex and there's a whole bunch of different people with different experiences and different spots that they're in their journey. Um, and so I think there's going to be a lot of different approaches that are, that are useful for, for those different scenarios, basically. I think that sounds like a very appropriate place to end it. Thank you so much, Tom. And I've had a blast talking about this and I love Fonalix and the work you do. And I will Continue to read your newsletters, go to your website. We'll put links to all these studies and more in the show notes so our listeners can catch up on all the great things happening over there as well. That's great. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a blast for, for both of our weeks. So. <laughs> You're good, Tom. You've been playing along very well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
I keep thinking of Jeopardy, where they like film five episodes all at once or whatever, but you have right. to like change your suit and tie or something. At least this is audio, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> and if anyone out there has any questions for us or wants to give their feedback, just send us an email, bekindpodcast at gmail.com. And if you have already, subscribe and share our podcast on Apple, Google, or Spotify or wherever podcasts are sold. Thanks again, everyone, and see you next week. Take care. Bye. Bye. Three, two, one. Meow, meow, meow. 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 Meow, meow, meow.